Hi, so I just finished preaching at the Chinese church this message which I prepared in about 30 minutes. I fell asleep. Uh, while preparing my draft, I woke up and went, I don't like this draft. So I prepared another one just before preaching it. So this is the text I'm going to read to you that I preached at the Chinese church. It's very short and it's called The Toast of Wrath. So here it goes. So this morning, I invented the toast of wrath. Here is the recipe. Number one, put your toast in the oven. Number two, read your Bible. Number three, forget about your toast. And number four, you get the toast of wrath. It is completely burnt, have it here. <laughs> the lesson of the day is this. Forgetfulness equals wrath or forgetfulness results in judgment. But the flip side to that is remembrance. Remembrance results in love and in God's salvation. And that's the main point from our passage today from Malachi chapter one. Three headings, forgetting God's love, forgetting God's wrath, and forgetting God's praise. God's love, God's wrath, God's praise. So let's look at Malachi chapter one. A prophecy, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? That's actually a very good question, by the way. How does God love me? You know, does God love me? And if you're not a Christian today, can I just say, please, please do ask that question. It's a really good question that the Bible answers clearly through the Lord Jesus Christ. So please do ask that question. However, in today's passage, this is not so much a question as it is a denial of God's love. God says, I love you. But then they say, I don't believe it. How have you loved us? Where do you love us? It's denying everything that God has done for Israel in the entire Old Testament. Now, Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, at least in our Bibles, but he's also the last of the Old Testament prophets, meaning that everything that comes before Malachi, all of this is pointing to Israel's history of God's love to them. And when they deny God's love, essentially what they're saying is when I look at all these pages, all I see are blank pages. I do not see your love in this history, in this book, in your word. That's what you're saying to God. And the way that God answers that denial, it's so interesting because he talks about his choosing love, his elective love, or some people call it his predestined love. And this is verse two. God says, was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord. Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. And I've turned his hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. You know, this is Genesis chapter 25. They have denied the entire Bible, everything in the Old Testament. And God says, okay, okay, okay. I'll go back to the very beginning. Go back to Genesis, the beginning of this word to show you my choosing love. And specifically, this is Genesis chapter 25. And what we see in Genesis chapter 25 are Jacob and Esau. These two sons, these two brothers, these two babies who have not yet been born. But God says in Genesis chapter 25, the older will serve the younger. Esau will serve his younger brother, Jacob. Esau I hated, but Jacob I loved. Well, eventually Jacob becomes Israel, Esau becomes Edom. They become fathers of these two nations, of these two peoples. And therefore God is answering that question to you. You know, how is it that you love me? You know, God is answering the question by saying, let's go way back. Let's go back to your great, 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 great grandfather. Maybe in China, there's this guy in my church, maybe in Milton Keynes. <laughs> You know who you are. God's saying, let's go way back to before you were even you, before you were even born. I chose you. I chose to love you before you chose me. I chose you before you were even you. And the first lesson is this. If God loves you, it's not because you chose God, but God chose you. God's love is dependent 100% on God, 0% on you and on me. And that's good news. That's fantastic news because it doesn't matter then who you are or how you do in school, whether you are a good student or a bad student, whether you're listening to this sermon or you're falling asleep, it doesn't matter because if God loves you, God loves you. That's the first point. If God loves you, well, God loves you through and through. But you know, that brings up our second point. What if God doesn't? What if he doesn't love me? Verse four, Edom may say, though we've been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. But this is what the Lord Almighty says. They may build, but I will demolish. They will be called the wicked land. The people always under the wrath of God. 
<laughs> now remember, Edom is the descendant of Esau, the Edomites. And you might say, why are they called the Esauites? <laughs> why the Edomites? Well, Esau was also known as Edom, which means red, and therefore his descendants are called the Edomites. The Edomites, what do they say in response to God's judgment? They say, we can make Edom great again. That's what they say, right? We can rebuild from the ruins. We can make Edom great again. But what does God say? Three things. Number one, whatever they build, I will demolish. Number two, they will be called the soy land or the wicked land. It's like Disneyland, except every ride in this Disneyland will kill you. Number three, they will be called a people always under the wrath of God, always under the anger of God. And the key word there is the word always. Imagine God always, always angry with you. Or imagine this, imagine whatever you do, coronavirus will always be around. That's so discouraging. That's a hard lesson that many rich, powerful, prosperous countries are learning right now. Nothing we seem to do works. How do we apply this? Well, open your eyes. This world is Esau land. It's the wicked land. We are a land under God's judgment, meaning the right response to judgment, to any calamity, is to turn back to God. So, hey, we need to turn back, we need to repent, we need to say sorry to God, we need to humble ourselves before God. But isn't it true that the most common response to any kind of tragedy is to say, we can fix this, we can do this, we can make this world, we can make this country great again, we can even make this church great again. You know, I volunteer with elderly, very old, very cranky people sometimes who call me off. Calvin, can you please help me with this? Calvin, this is not working, but I need this to be done. It's quite tiring. I don't look forward to those phone calls. It's love. It's showing practical love. But yesterday, I got a very encouraging phone call. Calvin, I don't want you to do anything for me today. All I want you to do is to pray for me because I'm stuck. I need God to help me out of this situation. And my question to you is this. What would it take for you? What would it take for you to pray? to humble yourself, to bow your knees and say to God, God, I need your help. I am sinful and I need your forgiveness. And that's our second point. It's remembering God's wrath. And it's saying to God, please be merciful to me, a sinner. Please forgive me in your mercy. Finally, finally, last point. Remembering God's praise. And this is verse five. Verse five says, you will see it with your own eyes and you will say, great is the Lord, even beyond the borders of Israel. And we've seen God's love, we've seen God's wrath. And here, the people who forgot God's love, Israel, saw a people under God's wrath and they give praise to God. That's incredible, right? God says, you will see it with your own eyes. And what do they see? They see Edom under God's judgment, under God's wrath, and they say, great is the Lord. That's life. It isn't until you meet a cancer patient, someone who has to go through chemotherapy, that you realize that, hey, despite my back ache, actually, I'm, I'm pretty healthy. Things are going pretty well. It isn't until you meet someone who's homeless, who doesn't have a pound in his pocket, until you realize that I have so many things. I am blessed beyond means. Maybe you've had a bad day. Maybe that's today, and you feel cranky, and you feel like complaining. And then you meet your friend, and they tell you how they've had a really, really horrible day. They're depressed. You listen to that, but at the end of it, you go, hey, actually, I feel better because I'm not as bad as that guy. <laughs> now, that's bad and that's sinful and that's superficial. But on one level, that's true. Suffering is kind of like a wake-up call to all the blessing, all the goodness we have received from a gracious God. It's one of the reasons why we must not shield children in church. You must not keep them away from seeing the real world as it is. And not just children, sometimes even adults as well. But that's on a superficial level. On a deeper level, where do you see God's love? How do you see God's love? And it's saying you see it in the suffering, the suffering of Christ. At the cross, we see one who is God's son, God's chosen one, who should be under God's eternal love, experiencing God's eternal judgment for our Six. We see the one who should be blessed, cursed. We see the one who should be loved, rejected, so that we could be accepted. We could be brought into God's kingdom. We see that and we go, great is the Lord, even beyond the borders of Israel. The last time I checked, I'm not Israelite, I'm not Jewish. <laughs> and yet, I have received this love. It's beyond borders of Israel, and yet I am not Israel that have received the full rights of God's people. Why? Because God's love overflows to me. It comes to me through Jesus Christ. Because he was punished, I was accepted. That wasn't done very well. But anyway, yeah, three points of what we've seen today. God's love, God's wrath, 
and God's praise. How do we apply this? Well, number one, remember God's love. Remember God's love. And that might mean just keeping a literal record of it. You know, write down a thank list. I learned this from Pastor Adrian Munoz. Thank God, not just for all the things he's given you, all the good things, but maybe even for some of the things that God in his wisdom has withheld from you. And most of all, read this book, give thanks for this thank list of all the things that God has done for us through the history of Israel, through the history of the Bible, come through Jesus Christ, come down to us. This book is there to keep us mindful of God's grace to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, remember his love. That's number one. Number two, remember God's wrath, his anger, especially when times go bad. It's not luck. Chinese say choi choi choi. No. It is a wake-up call that we are sinful and only God is able to save. In fact, He's willing to save. Pray for ourselves when that happens and pray for this world. Pray for our non-Christian friends, our non-Christian family members, that they would turn and they would see their Savior. Turn away from their sin and to see the Lord Jesus Christ. And there we see forgiveness and faith and eternal life. Remember God's wrath. But finally, remember God's praise. And the cross reminds us that we can praise Jesus in any and every situation, especially when things go bad, especially when things are tough. Because he was condemned, I will always be loved. Because he suffered and he died, no matter what happens to me, if I suffer and I die, well, one day I will be raised. One day I will see Jesus face to face in the time to come and into eternity. Now let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this reminder in times of difficulty, in times of darkness, that Jesus Christ took our darkness, took our judgment on himself. And there we see our salvation. There we see our acceptance. And there we're able to say, great is the Lord, even beyond the borders of Israel. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.